morning, church. It's great to see you here today on this last Sunday of April, which happens to be the third Sunday of Easter. This Easter season lasts for 50 days, and so you see that the Paschal candle is lit behind me as a reminder of the resurrection, and we keep it lit throughout every Sunday during the Easter season. A couple of things about our worship this morning. One is we're delighted to have the choir leading us in the service music, and so we hope that you will join along. And if you would like to join the choir um, during this interim time, please be in touch with Alcy and let him know of your interest, um, and he'll send you the information so you can participate. You don't have to be a professional singer in order to join in this virtual experience. Um, the way technology works, it makes all of us sound good. So if you would like to consider this, I do hope that you'll reach out to us through the office. Also, we are continuing online worship at least through May 20th. So um, as anything changes, we will let you know so that you can prepare for how to be a part of worship as we go forward. Lastly, I just want to remind you that we will have an opportunity during worship for online giving. This makes a huge difference in the ministry that we carry out together as the church. There are ways that we make possible our response to the world through various organizations we support, and we intend to continue supporting them this year. So your donation to the church, your contribution, your pledge makes all of that possible, and we hope that you will um, consider how you can continue to contribute even during this time. So as we begin our worship, I hope you have your leaflet in front of you, and I invite you to find a comfortable position and to prepare your hearts and minds for um, the chance to praise and worship this morning.
Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Blessed Son made himself known to his disciples in the breaking of bread. Open the eyes of our faith that we may behold him in all his redeeming work, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Christ according to Luke. On the first day of the week, two of Jesus' followers were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. 
but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself and all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening up the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you're not already seated, please be seated. On March 23rd, which seems like a lifetime ago, which but was barely a month ago, there was an article published in the Harvard Business Review that was written by Scott Berenato, and it was entitled, That Discomfort You're Feeling is Grief. Grief is a feeling that can creep up on us on any number of occasions, but we're not always anticipating it unless it's surrounding death. Indeed, there's been a lot of research on grief and what it is, how it demonstrates itself in our lives. No doubt you're familiar with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's work on five dimensions of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. I say dimensions of grief because when it was first coined as stages of grief, it made it sound like they were stepping stones, as if you literally moved one through the other, starting first perhaps at denial, and then going to anger, and then moving on to bargaining, then depression, and then acceptance. But lived experience reveals that it's not a linear process, and that we can bounce around between any one of those five feelings as we reckon with grief. David Kessler, a partner of Dr. Kubler-Ross's in this work, acknowledges that there's another dimension to grief as well, and that is in making meaning of the grief. This is where I think we find these disciples in our gospel lesson this morning, as they're walking the seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus, talking with one another, trying to make meaning, trying to make sense of what they've experienced over these last few days. Actually, over the last week, 
but intensely starting from Jesus's Last Supper with them into his betrayal and his um, trial and then his torture and crucifixion. And now they've arrived three days later on this Easter day, that's what we're reading from, to realize that Jesus is not in the tomb. And they're trying to make sense of this. They're trying to make meaning of it. What is happening here? How does all of this work? We find them on this Easter day, that's where the scripture takes us, back to that Easter day, walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus and working it out. Working it out in their conversations with one another about what exactly is going on here. And that's when the stranger happens into their midst and inquires from them what they're talking about. And it says, looking sad, they said to him, Grief had overcome them. And as they engage this stranger in this conversation, they start to make meaning of it in new ways. This stranger that comes alongside of them recounts to them God's salvation history, starting with Moses. Yes, a good place to start. Moses, God's person who he calls into a part of his redeeming work in creation. Moses, the one that is summoned by the living God in that burning bush out in this father-in-law's field while he's tending to sheep, and calls him by name to liberate his people from their oppression. The Hebrew people were enslaved in Egypt. They knew themselves only under Pharaoh's rule. They had forgotten who they were. They only knew themselves as those who served the Pharaoh. And God wanted to call them out of that bondage into liberty into freedom. He needed someone to help him, and he summoned Moses and asked him to assist. And if you read that story, you recall that Moses has some resistance about this whole thing, but indeed finally says he will respond to God's invitation. And it is a trying leadership. He asked the Pharaoh to relieve, release the Hebrew people. And as you remember, Pharaoh waffles on that back and forth, and God sends one plague after another in an effort to get Pharaoh to let go, let go, let go of my people. Until ultimately he sends the plague of the death of the firstborn. Every firstborn of the Egyptians, not only of their people, but of all of the, their cattle and livestock as well. That is what finally distracts the Egyptians from their attention on these slaves that they had in their grasp. And the Hebrew people are liberated to leave Egypt. And it's only a momentarily, a moment later that the Egyptians realize what has happened and they pursue the Hebrew people. And and God liberates them through the Red Sea, frees them into a new land so that they might come into the promised land. It's through Moses that they receive more greatly their identity, where they receive the law, a way in which they can practice this covenant relationship with God in every fabric, every feature of their lives. The story goes on because we're covering thousands of years here. The Hebrew people eventually wish that they had a king, and they lament to God, why can't we have a king? Everybody else has a king. And God says to them, really, you really don't want a king. I am all that you need. But when you read it in the scriptures, you see that they whined and complained more. And so finally, God gives them a king. Their first king is Saul, and he really wasn't that great. And then they had the king, David. And David was a man after God's own heart. David was a king who knew he had a king and remembered who God was in his life and in the life of the people that God had called this Israelite community, these Hebrew people who God called and made his own It's David who had the life of prayer, who wrote most of the psalms that we still pray today, who recognized who God is and reflected that in his ruling of the Hebrew people. His son Solomon followed him, and he did a pretty okay job, but it started to fall apart after that until the kingdom of Israel was divided into two kingdoms, and the regions around it began attacking and and, um, coming into their midst, And they lost their way yet again, these people, these Hebrew people. They couldn't find who they were in God. And so the prophets over the years called out to them, asking them to return to God, to remember who they are. We remember Elijah, who fought so hard for God's people, 
again against the king and the queen. We remember Isaiah, who gave an I a vision of what God's reign would be like in the suffering servant and the one who would come and make a new, new reality where the wolf and lamb would lie down together. Or the prophet Micah, who said the words which so many people remember even today, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God? Or Ezekiel, who was given the vision of dry bones out in a field and witnessed the living God unite those bones, sinews and muscle and skin and then breath into a people to raise up the people that God needed. Or Hosea, another prophet who speaks of the Hebrew people's betrayal of God as an unfaithful wife. And God is put in the part of the loving husband who's been betrayed. This is the fullness of time in which God then brings into the world God's own self, his son Jesus. To continue the redeeming work that God has begun from the very beginning and to make known the reality of the kingdom that God has set forth to make known from the very beginning with God's chosen people, God's creation. John the Baptist heralds the coming of the Christ. He goes out into the wilderness and says to everyone, repent, turn from your wicked ways and live. The one who is coming after me, I'm not even worthy to untie the sandals of. And it is Jesus who comes. Jesus who has been given the spirit the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, Jesus says, when he reads from the scriptures in the synagogue of his family. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, he says, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. This is why Jesus came. And it's in his ministry, only three years long, that he seeks to reveal what God is up to. The saving work that God is about, he demonstrates it with his very life, in the healing that he does. And even when John the Baptist, imprisoned, wonders, is, Jesus, are you really the Christ, or are we to wait for another? Jesus sends word back to John and says, remember what he has seen, that the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the sick are healed, and the oppressed, the oppressed are liberated. This is the kingdom that Jesus has come to bring to fulfillment, and he told his disciples that it would require him to suffer and to die and to be raised again, and they didn't believe him. Peter, the very one that's in this scripture, told Jesus, no, I'll never let that happen to you. And if you recall, Jesus says to him, get behind me, Satan for your ways are not the ways of God. This is what Jesus, this stranger on the road to Emmaus, is recounting to these two disciples, making meaning of all that they have seen and experienced, helping them realize that this is the fulfillment of what God has done, that Jesus in coming into the world did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law and to give us the way in which to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love our neighbor as ourself. This is the meaning that's being made from all of this. And the disciples discover it, not in his words, but in his actions. When he joins them at the table and he breaks the bread, a familiar engagement that they always had with Jesus, their Lord. It's then that they see him. I wonder what meaning God is trying to make in the suffering that we now experience, in the grief that we have, the losses that we are counting. Imagine with me, if you will, imagine that you're out on the sidewalk and a stranger comes along and asks, why are you wearing masks and gloves? Would you not say to that stranger, are you the only one in the world that doesn't know that we have a pandemic, a viral pandemic? And here it is that we were trying to make something good happen in the world. We were trying to do our part to bring about a new reality and everything's gotten knocked off course. The structures that we've used, the ways and the mechanisms that we've availed ourselves of, everything 
is not as it was. And imagine, if you will, Jesus speaking into this situation, revealing to us how God will make meaning come from us, from this, and enlist us in the effort. Everything that we've known has been reoriented. We can't find our meaning in our job or in our income. All of that's gotten shifted around. We can't find meaning in the same way in our affiliations and in our clubs. Sometimes we're not even meeting with them. We can't find meaning in our achievements. Some of them seem ridiculous. We can't find meaning in our future, our imagined future, one that includes a 401k or some type of a retirement plan. We're not even certain that that'll exist in the same way. We can't find meaning in our purchasing power, in our ability to purchase and to exercise some type of control through the use of our money. And that is when Jesus speaks into the grief and loss and gives us the meaning that we actually need, the meaning we're longing for. Our meaning is in the risen Lord. It's in the redemptive work of God. And we need to remember that it's God that brings life from death. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, Jesus said, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind. He has set me to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That's what Jesus came for, and that's what Jesus still wants to do. This last weekend, um, on Friday night into Saturday, an email arrived in your inbox if you are on our email mailing list giving you some ways to consider how to attend to the societal woes that have been made so evident in the suffering that we now all collectively endure. I invited you in a list of various things that are most accessible at this moment to consider the, the relationship between various things that maybe we've had the liberty or luxury or privilege to not have to consider before. What is the interconnection between race and health and economics that's being made most evident during this time? How is it that we learn how to pray when we don't know maybe even what our words are? What do we do about indigenous people who have been a part of this land for 12,000 years and the political um, dialogue that threatens their very place? What do we do about creation and the effects that our own use of it and exploitation have brought to our attention. How do we engage in civil discourse in topics that maybe we have fallen out of habit in talking about person to person and instead have just taken to um, diatribes or at least firm statements that don't allow us to engage with one another? My friends, we definitely grieve for the loss of the world that we have known. If it wasn't perfect, at least it was familiar. If it wasn't ideal, at least we knew how to live in it. But my question to you, to all of us, is what does God want to bring forth from the losses that we have? What life is God trying to bring forth from the deaths that are evident? How is God trying to change what we knew, transform it into something new, a new creation? Let us remember. Let us remember our salvation story so that we can discover the salvation that God is doing even now. That is what we're called to do. We're called to do that in reading the scriptures. We're called to do that when we gather in prayer. And we're called to do that when we come together in worship recounting our salvation story so that we can remember ourselves and discover ourselves yet again in the narrative that is God's, in what God is doing, in the creation that God is establishing, in the new kingdom that God is making known. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia.
I invite you now to stand as we affirm our faith and say together the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us who journey on the way with Christ, risen and ever present in mystery, pray for the world with all our heart and mind, saying, Lord, hear our prayer. For the church universal and for this community of faith, that we may wholeheartedly devote ourselves to the apostolic teaching, to common life, to the breaking of bread, and the life of prayer, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all nations and people of this wide earth, that we may be delivered from human devices of oppression and from false idols and futile ways, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That all who grieve or who are desperate or haunted by violence may know the hidden strength of Christ present. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the homeless, those without bread, those tempted by vengeance and driven to rage, that they may find refuge and strength in the one who walks with them. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the children of calamity and for our own children, that they may come to know and to claim the promises of God to all generations, near and far off, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. I invite you to name, either silently or aloud, those for whom you pray. For all of those who are on the front lines of providing for people's health and safety, medical personnel, first responders of all kinds, employees who serve in the chain of providing food and medical supplies, mental health professionals, government officials, and others known to you alone, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Preserve us all, O Lord, and take us home to your heart, so that all our lives may be woven together in prayer and praise, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. I invite you to turn and share a sign of God's peace. As we prepare to bring forward our offerings, I want to direct your attention again to your capacity to text give. Any amount is appreciated and makes a difference in the ministries that we carry forward in this way. Um, I would add um, to our prayers, it occurred to me, of the significance of religion and a spiritual life in navigating all of this. And so not only for our Christian brothers and sisters, but for our Jewish brothers and sisters and, and Muslim brothers and sisters and others who are um, taking to God in prayer the circumstances we all find ourselves in, um, we trust God's work in and through us. 
Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God. As we gather together at this holy table, we remember those who have died this week and who are mourned here on earth but join the company of heaven. We remember this morning June Bridgewater, grandmother of Erica Hagen, and we remember Ron Barlow, father of Gail Hagel, grandfather of Elizabeth Jenner and Christopher. And we remember this morning Kelly Van Meter, husband of Lauren and father of Maddie and Jackie. May they rest in peace and rise in glory. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. 
It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. But chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb, who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death he has destroyed death, and by his rising to life again he has won for us everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in the word spoken through the prophets and above. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where with Stephen and all your saints we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. Let us pray. My Jesus, 
I believe that you are truly present in the blessed sacrament of the altar. I love you above all things and long for you in my soul. Since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. As though you have already come, I embrace you and unite myself entirely to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. The God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.
go forth in the name of Christ. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. alleluia.